Hi, I'm Robert Williamson, Jr., professor of religious studies at Hendricks College and the co-host of the Bible Worm podcast. I'm also the author of The Forgotten Books of the Bible. So, just as a reminder, the Book of Lamentations is set in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE by the Babylonians. And it is reflecting the experience of the people who remain in the land after the destruction of the city. The people who uh, survived the siege, survived the attack, were not taken into exile, and now they're living in the ruins of their former home. Um, and they're grappling physically, emotionally, theologically with um, how, they, how they move on with their lives. The Book of Lamentations, as we talked about last time, is written in multiple voices, uh, which creates this really interesting kind of dialogue that we'll talk more about that allows multiple perspectives to kind of rest alongside each other without being resolved. And it creates a really interesting kind of richness, open, opening up space within the book. Last time we talked about two of those voices, the funeral singer, uh, who I argued anyway was started out as kind of a passive observer and ended up as kind of an empathetic um, encourager, an ally, if you will, to, um, to the traumatized daughter Zion. The second character was daughter Zion herself, the personified city of Jerusalem, who um, spoke about her pain, asked for someone to comfort her, and really just kind of shook her fist at God, uh, saying, you are only an angry God, there is no compassion here, um, what kind of God are you? And then really just kind of falling silent, never, never resolving um, back into any kind of relationship with the deity. Today we're going to start out by looking at what really is just, I mean in my reading anyway, almost the opposite perspective of Daughter Zion in some ways. This is a fellow who uh, my teacher Kathleen O'Connor refers to him as the strong man. Uh, he starts his speech in 3-1, Ani HaGever, I am the man, and the word there, Gever, is a word that the root is related to a warrior or something like that. So the strong man, he's kind of a, he's kind of a manly man. Uh, who is uh, also a survivor of the destruction of Jerusalem. So when he starts out, the strong man talks much like daughter Zion did about the experience of um, the, the pain of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And like daughter Zion did, he attributes um, the suffering he has experienced to God's hand. And so here at the beginning, he refers to God's angry rod. God has driven him away into darkness. God turns his hand against the strong man over and over again all day long, uh, wears him out, besieges him, puts him in dark places. He describes God as a bear lurking, as a lion hiding, who tore him apart, made him desolate. Uh, here he talks about God as, a, as an archer, um, trying to using the, the strong man as target practice, pulling back his bow and launching arrows into his guts. Uh, as the strongman has become God's um, target practice. With this pretty dramatic imagery, he talks about God crushing his teeth into the gravel. That The image there is like God's boot grinding the strongman's face into the ground, uh, pressed me down into the ashes. Then we get this kind of moment of reflection from the strongman. Uh, I've rejected peace. I've forgotten good. I thought I have no future. I can't help but remember and am depressed. Now, up until this moment, the strong man sounds, in my mind, a lot like Daughter Zion. He's acknowledging the, the pain he has endured. He is saying that God is the source of that pain. Uh, and at this moment in verse 20, he's not sure that there is any hope. But the strong man, unlike Daughter Zion, makes a turn in his theology. If you have ever heard a Sermon on Lamentations, odds are that it was on this next passage that we're about to look at in 321. The strong man says, But I call this to mind, therefore I have hope. Certainly all, the faithful love of the Lord hasn't ended. Certainly God's compassion isn't through. They are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now this is one of the most kind of beautiful prayers in all of the Bible. Um, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Uh, your compassion is renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's, it's this 
expression of trust in the divine, that God's compassion wins over God's anger, that there is mourning that comes after the darkness, that uh, that God is ultimately a God who restores. Now, if you remember, the daughter Zion said, you are only angry and have no compassion. Here, the strong man is saying, you are angry, but ultimately your compassion is what is going to win the day. Now, the strong man continues on reflecting on what it means to suffer at the hands of God. And what he says is, it's good for a man to carry a yoke in his youth. He should sit alone and be silent when God lays it on him. He should put his mouth in the dirt. So he should take it. He should lower himself. He, he should let God hit him. Um, he should offer his cheek for a blow, like turn your cheek to the smiter. Let yourself be hit again. He should be filled with shame. So here the strong man is saying the suffering is in some way good for me, redemptive for me. Uh, it it uh, iron sharpens iron or however you want to think about it. But he, what he's saying is uh, people who are suffer ought to lean into the suffering because God is uh, teaching them something or showing them something. Then he says, my Lord won't reject forever. Although he has caused grief, he will show compassion in measure with his covenant loyalty. He definitely doesn't enjoy affliction making humans suffer. Now, this is a fascinating little passage, right? So he's acknowledging that God is angry and that God has rejected. He's following the reward-punishment Deuteronomistic theology here, that God is angry because the people have disobeyed, so God is angry for a time. But God's compassion will ultimately win out. God will remember his, God's loyalty to the covenant. And then that last line, God doesn't enjoy affliction. Like, God doesn't want to do this. God has to do this. It's almost like that, you know, when you, when you hear parents say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, which is never true. But that's what that's what the line here is that the strong man is saying is, God doesn't want to be punishing you, but or punishing him, punishing us. Um, but God has to do it because that's the covenant that God made. Then a few verses later, the strong man speaks to his community and he says, we, we must examine and search our ways. We must return to the Lord. We should lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We are the ones who did wrong. We rebelled. All right, let's just pause there and think about what the strong man has said compared to what daughter Zion said last time. Both of them are saying, God is the one who is attacking them. God is the cause of their suffering. Both of them at one level or another are saying that God is angry with them because of something that they did. The strong man is owning it. We are the ones who did wrong. We rebelled. Daughter Zion kind of, she suggested that maybe she did wrong. But her point was, no matter what she did, she did not deserve to be punished the way she was punished. Should women eat their children in the in the streets no they should not god is only anger not compassion daughter zion ended with a fist shake and basically seemed to break the relationship there is no future here the strong man gets to the same point and then turns so god's anger is not the end of the story god will be compassionate how do we know well, because God has been compassionate in the past. Now, these two, just as a reminder, are both survivors. They're both people who talk about the trauma that they themselves experienced. So it's interesting. To, to, they're processing it very differently. One is anger and rejection. One is uh, submission and um, acceptance. And there's a real question about can, who's right? Or can daughter Zion and the strong man get along? Like their, their approaches are very, very different. Most people, I suspect, prefer one of those theologies or the other. I myself am a daughter Zion kind of person where I think if you are being punished unfairly, you ought to shake your fist and keep shaking it. But I know lots of people and um, many of them at my little community that I pastor, Mercy Community Church here in Little Rock, 
where many of my friends are homeless and they are very much strongman theology. We're suffering, but we're suffering because of something we did. God is uh, angry with us, but God is not going to be angry forever and there's still hope in the future. So people fall in one of these camps or the other, and often we want to correct each other and say, no, you should, you should, you should be my way. So we'll be interested to see what Lamentations does with these two voices. But first, there is a fourth voice uh, in Lamentations, and I call him the scoffer. I do not like him, uh, but, he, but he's in the book. And so I, I think he's there to challenge me in some kind of a way. But the scoffer is like the funeral singer at the beginning of the book. He doesn't talk about his own pain. So I don't think of him as a survivor. I think of him as a bystander, an onlooker. He thinks in economic terms. It's kind of interesting. So uh, the, the riches have been tarnished. And then Zion's children, who were once valued as pure gold, now they are worth no more than clay pots made by a potter. So his worry is that the community has lost its value. The, the children have lost their value. It's a, I mean, it's a weirdly kind of cynical view of what's happened when he looks at this mass of human suffering and says, ah, they're not worth what they used to be worth. He goes on then to say, even jackals, the, the wild scavengers of the desert, offer the breast they nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel like des desert ostriches. The baby's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. Thirsty, children ask for bed, beg for it. But there is no bread. Now this is a really cynical reading of what's happening, right? What he's saying is the mothers of these poor starving children are worse than the jackal mothers because at least jackals feed their babies. But these women don't even give their children bread when they need it. Now remember, he's saying this about women who are living in a city that is besieged by the Babylonian army. And we've seen that line about, you know, people considering whether they have to eat each other in order to survive. And he's critiquing them because they don't have bread to give their children. But the women want to give their children bread, right? The problem is there's no bread to be given. The problem is a systemic problem. The problem is that this, these, this power struggle between these armies has impoverished the people. But here he is blaming the victim for, uh, for, for their poor parenting when in fact they have no option. This sounds like rhetoric we hear in our own time, in our own place, where people blame poor mothers for not taking care of their children when in fact they're bending over backwards but the system is stacked against them now finally the scoffer comes back to the reward punishment theology and says the lord scattered them they did not honor the priest's presence they did not favor the elders so it's their fault that they're suffering now the scoffer in this sense, reminds me of the funeral singer. Um, he's a detached observer. He's very judgmental. He's processing through his own lenses. But unlike the funeral singer, he never takes the time to listen or to hear the voice of the tra traumatized. He never empathizes. He never starts to weep or to wish to be a comforter. He just is a, is a judge. And that's all he's got. And yet... As much as I want to get rid of that guy because he has nothing useful to offer me, the Book of Lamentations embraces him, keeps him around. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Finally, in chapter 5, we get to the community voice. This voice speaks as a first-person plural, we. So one way of imagining what's happened here is that the community voice has listened to these first four voices. The funeral singer, daughter Zion, strongman, scoffer. And now comes its response. Chapter 5 is the last chapter of the book. And so we're expecting that there's going to be some kind of conclusion here. But what I want to suggest to you is that that's not what the community voice actually ends up giving us. So let, let me show you what I mean. First of all, in 5.1, the community voice says, Lord, consider what has become of us. Take notice of our disgrace. 
look at it. Now this language, take notice, look, Hebrew habita re'e. This is uh, daughter Zion's language, if you remember from Lamentations 1 and 2. She's, this is what she says, remember, look, see. So here the community is echoing her voice. I didn't really talk about it, but this word harpa, disgrace, that's a strong man word. He likes to talk about the disgrace, the shame of the community. Um, and so it's interesting in this first verse that the community voice affirms something of daughter Zion and something of the strong man. It's the community voice is trying to find a way, I think, of embracing both of these figures. Uh, if you th these are daughter Zion's words um, from back from chapter one. Look, look, uh, take notice, take notice. Those are the same words that you see in five one. So the community voice is is uh, recognizing her, and then uh, here again in two twenty, take notice. At the same time, this is the strong man who talks about disgrace in three thirty and again in three sixty one. So the community voice has started out of the gate trying to say uh, we we affirm. We, we, want the, we want daughter Zion to hear herself in our voice, but then they turn around and say, we want the strong man to hear himself in our voice. Remember, they've got these two voices, the strong man and daughter Zion, who could not be more different in their theologies. In 516, the community voice seems to acknowledge the reward punishment theology. The crown has fallen from our head. We are doomed because we sinned. That is reward punishment. We're being punished because we did something wrong. That sounds like the strong man. But in 5.7, they say our father's sin, that is our ancestor's sin, and they're gone. We're burdened with their iniquities. Now that's taking a step back from the uh, reward punishment theology and saying we didn't do anything, but we're suffering because previous generations did something. That sounds more like something that daughter Zion has said. So again, we find the community voice embracing these two perspectives, trying to hold them together. Now, the community voice goes for a long time describing its own suffering. And you can hear imagery familiar from both the strong man and daughter Zion. In 519, then the community voice makes what is often called a turn toward God. So the community voice says, but you, Lord, will rule forever. This is the common English Bible translation. Your throne lasts from one generation to the next. Now, that translation sounds like the strong man, right? It sounds like the uh, turn toward God, um, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. That's the strong man. So you might be tempted to think that with this line, uh, the, that... The community voice is leaning toward the strong man. But hang on a sec. The Hebrew literally says, You, Lord, sit forever on your throne from one generation to the next. Now, in the Psalms, Psalm 74 and elsewhere, you'll hear this, You, Lord, sit forever. And then the next line is, Rise up and, you know, carry out your vengeance. But that never happens in Lamentations. It's just, you sit forever. And so that sounds like, if you read it that way, that God is just sitting there on the throne while the people are being destroyed, and that God, they have no confidence that God's actually going to get up and do anything. That sounds like daughter Zion. So, so here's what I think is happening. The community voice is trying to speak words that have enough ambiguity, or maybe said enough spaciousness, that both the strong man and daughter Zion, who have very different theologies, can say the same words and yet be meaning different things. That is, the community prefers that th that the strong man and daughter Zion both get to stay part of the community. It values that more than it values that they have the right or the best or the correct theology. It wants them to be heard and valued, their voices in the community. 
Now from there, the communal voice says to God, why do you forget us continually? Why do you abandon us for such a long time? And then says, return us to yourself. Please let us return. Give us new days like those long ago. Now that's verse 521. Here's 522, the concluding book, the chapter of the book, concluding verse of the book. And you think this verse is going to settle everything for us, but it doesn't. Here's the NRSV's translation. Return us, restore us, unless you have completely rejected us or have become too angry with us. Now, if you translate it that way, what it sounds like is, God, please restore us unless you've rejected us, but we don't think you have. Read that way, it sounds like the strong man. You've been angry with us, but bring us back. But that unless you see there underlined and italicized, the Hebrew there is ki'im, which is a ambi ambivalent, ambiguous uh, translation here that scholars argue and argue and argue about. But it is also possible to translate that same phrase. So 521, return us, please let us return, give us new days like those of old. But rather or but instead, you have completely rejected us and have become too angry with us. Now, if you read it that way, what that sounds like is the people have this kind of vague wish for a return, but instead they know that God has actually rejected them and is too angry to restore them. Now that sounds like daughter Zion, right? Now the Ki'im particle can really be translated either one of these ways. There's, a, there's actually a couple of other ways that it can be translated. And what scholars for a long time did was they tried to argue out which one of those is the right translation. But I think maybe a better approach is to say, what is the uh, interpretive effect of there being an ambiguous particle there? And the rhetorical effect in my mind is that it creates space in the meaning intentionally so, or at least usefully so, so that the strong man can say, translation one, restore us unless you've rejected us, but I don't think you have. And daughter Zion can say the second one, restore us, but you're not going to because you're too angry. In Hebrew, those are exactly the same words, but their meaning has this kind of space. So here again, what I think is happening is Lamentations 5, and then, then the book as a whole, now that we're at the end, what it's done is it's tried to create space for people with very, very different responses to trauma, different ways of processing grief, different relationships with God, whether it's angry, whether it's hurt, whether it's hopeful, uh, whether it's um, repentant, all of these kinds of ways of relating to God can be held together by this kind of ambivalent poem in Lamentations chapter 5. The book doesn't feel the need to settle one or pick one or choose one. Instead, what the book values is the holding together of community. They would rather hold these five voices together rather than settle, settle among them the correct doctrine, the correct theolo theology, the correct theological response, and therefore push somebody to the margins. Rather, what they value is the togetherness of the community more than they value the theological conformity of the community. It's a really beautiful thing. And this, this sort of thing that if we could figure out how to model that as communities of faith, especially for traumatized people and traumatized communities to say, you process this the way you need to process this, and we're here with you, and we will speak words um, that sound familiar to you, that affirm you, even if what you say and what someone else says are not the same. We, we, we want you here with us. We, we value you more than we value your correct or incorrect theology. Now, one last detail about Lamentations that's just really interesting is that Lamentations is, by and large, written as an alphabetic acrostic. That is, uh, every poem is, follows the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tav, 22 verses, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. In English, that would be 26 verses, right? A, B, C, down to Z. Uh, a fellow named David Slavitt has uh, translated Lamentations and tried to 
hold the acrostic pattern. So in, this is chapter one. Chapters one and two have this pattern. There's an A, a lass, and then a couple of lines. And then there's B, bereft, in, in Hebrew, bet. And then there's C, in Hebrew, gemel. So alas, bereft, captive. Um, and it follows that line all the way through, D, E, F, G, uh, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zion, so on. That's chapters one and two. Chapter three, when the strong man speaks, and remember the strong man was this very insistent macho guy, the pattern triplicates. So the strong man in chapter three, A, 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 afflicted, abused, against, then B, 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 bones, bitterness, banished, C, 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 chained, crying, crooked. Fascinating, fascinating the way that this poetry is written. Chapter four then goes back to the pattern of chapter one and two, more or less. And then chapter five, in this really curious way, has 22 verses, the same as the number total number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but it's not an acrostic. So it it's like it's remembering that there is an alphabetic acrostic pattern, but it's not conformed to it. Now, the question that I would ask you if you were here with me is I would ask you, why do you think that that's significant interpretively? Like, how would you interpret the, why would, why would you think someone would write about uh, trauma in, in an alphabetic acrostic? Some of the things that get suggested, which I think are pretty good responses, one is that the people are trying to express the totality of their suffering from A to Z, from Aleph to Tav. Uh, and so it, they're trying to, um, they're trying to, show the breadth of it. And then in chapter five, which is not an alphabetic acrostic, it sort of uh, breaches the bounds of the alphabet and kind of runs a little free. Other people talk about um, trauma being chaotic and overwhelming, and you've got to have some way of organizing it. So I don't know how to start talking about what I've experienced, but if, if you say, well, say something that starts with A, maybe I can do that, and then B, and then C, and then so on. So it's an attempt to contain the chaos. Other people have argued that it's an attempt to remember. We don't want to ever forget this thing that has happened to us. And so we're going to commit it to memory by making it structured in a way that we can recall the whole thing. I think these are all really interesting and beautiful and possible interpretations of the acrostic. One that I also think is really uh, useful is that these voices, especially Daughter Zion's voice and the strong man's voice, but also the funeral singer's voice and even the scoffer's voice, bless his heart. Um, they're all written at, in this alphabetic acrostic. And so they belong to each other, recognizably so, whether they want to or not. So even if the strong man and daughter Zion say, we don't want to have anything to do with each other, they're still marked by this alphabetic pattern that holds them together. So the community binds them even when they might prefer to withdraw from the community. They're, they're marked by the communal pattern, even though they might be, be feeling alienated from the community. I think it's this, this really beautiful idea. We, we, we belong to each other, whether we like it or not sometimes, we belong to each other. Um, and so we need to figure out how to lift up and affirm and encourage and, and, and show compassion for each other, even when our theologies are divergent, even when we think somebody should protest more, or even when we think somebody should repent more. Um, let, let their response be what it is and find ways of embracing them in the community. That's what I think Lamentations has to offer for us. And, you know, you can think of all kinds of ways that that's relevant to our contemporary situation and the kinds of communities and people that are experiencing trauma now and have been experiencing trauma for generations past. And thinking about what does it mean for us to be community for and with those folks. I think Lamentations is rich ground for having that conversation.